uh, in Europe, maybe uh, more so than anywhere else, uh, LGBT rights uh, have emerged at the heart of the expansion of the human rights uh, uh, framework, um, yet they remain really contested among states. And so we see them often as perceived in states as you know, challenging the foundation upon which uh, national identity rests. But scholars have said that we have to understand clashes or study clashes of social systems to understand how the world changes. And I think uh, norms providing LGBT rights provide that case. And Poland, a case that I'll talk about briefly later today is uh, which I studied um, in depth for, uh, for my book um, is one of those cases you know, that was considered a difficult case. There was really low familiarity with LGBTI people and rights norms in the, uh, you know, 20 years ago. And even 15 years ago, there were still uh, bills being introduced to ban LGBTI uh, uh, people from teaching in, in, uh, in schools and, um, and also attempts to ban uh, public demonstrations in various Polish cities. Yet despite that, Activists were able to more uh, to mobilize despite this, you know, closed domestic political opportunity structure, forming ties to um, uh, to other states to really draw attention to Poland and channel resources for the movement. So this becomes a story, you know, about how uh, local activists can channel transnational support to affect domestic politics, and it's also a story about how norm becomes can become salient and people can come out under broader conditions of visibility. So I'll come back to the Polish case in a little bit. Uh, Europe is methodologically interesting for this because LGBT rights, um, it's the first region that enshrined LGBT rights in international law, um, which is Article 13 of the Amsterdam Treaty, but, uh, but there's also various uh, court cases and uh, non-binding uh, parliament resolutions that have led some scholars like Kelly Coleman to say that we see the development of an international norm uh, protecting LGBT rights uh, in, uh, in the European region. Yet, um, you know, what I'm looking at is the fact that there's still a lot of variation despite this norm across states. So I want to understand why the norm, you know, hits harder in certain states uh, than in others. And that's precisely what leads to my question which is why are the trajectories of rights recognition different? And there's two ways to look at that, you know, or that I look at that, compliance, which is change at the level of the state, and then also internalization, the degree to which, um, you know, societies and states actually change their mind um, around LGBT rights. And I look in my talk today, I'll briefly present some uh, data uh, on compliance. And in terms of you know, the uh, theoretical landscape and literature that helped uh, me uh, frame this work, a lot of it was uh, came from the foundation that the early work on LGBT rights recognition looked at domestic explanations. So it was how religious the country is, how wealthy it was, um, you know, what was the organizing capacity of domestic movements, how, uh, what level of democracy uh, did it have? And that led to kind of the usual suspects like the Netherlands or Sweden being the kind of ca cases that were seen as ripe for this um, proliferation. Yet what it missed was this new wave of new adopter states that exist on almost all continents that have also introduced these rights. And, and for these states, there's really a strong international and transnational explanation. And that's what I, what I try to focus on. And there's many theories in IR that uh, help us gain traction on this question, but a lot of them also had gaps where the phenomena around LGBT rights wasn't fully explained. And I have some of those explanations you know, that have uh, issues um, on the slide here, and, and that's something, you know, for the sake of time, I will save to the to the Q&A. Um, but uh, this is the variation that um, existing theories had trouble explaining, and you don't have, there's a lot going on in the slide, excuse me for that, but I just want you to see that there's variation across European states. This is, these bars represent an index of LGBT rights legislation on a 12 point uh, scale that looks at various kinds of pro LGBT rights. And you see them at three different time points from 1990 to 2000 to 2010. And um, you know, in my work, I'm looking at uh, this variation across all EU states, but I also look at, uh, I look at states divided as first mover and uh, new adopter states. Uh, and today I wanna show you a snippet of the analysis from the, looking at the variation between new adopter states. Those are the states that joined the EU in 2004 and seven. And then my book has a lot of qualitative material on the cases of Germany, Poland, and Slovenia. Um, so I argue, you know, to, 
pretty straightforward argument that states care about their image as members of the European community, but they must be able to see the norms they're meant to comply with. And this is this concept of norm visibility, which I, I argue is the relative ability of publics and governments to see and interact with the ideas and images that define standards of appropriate behavior. So what that means is that while a norm might exist, its felt intensity might be different across states. And it might be different according to three different channels that should make states more porous to the norm being visible. And those channels include um, two international channels of social and political uh, um, visibility. So a social channel would be, for example, openness to ideas and information. That could be, you know, the so-called will and grace effect that, you know, the media introduces uh, uh, certain groups um, to new audiences. Um, a political uh, effect is openness to the International Society of States, and that's measured, for examples, and you know, entry into IOs. Um, the third concept that I look at and spend time on is norm brokerage, which is a mediated channel that connects domestic LGBTI movements to transnational advocacy networks. And it looks at the number of them and how that varies across time. And here you see this, you know, a cartoon that kind of represents some of this transnational pressure, which is after this Irish couple um, are able to marry after Ireland passed marriage equality. They're passing the bouquet and it says marriage equality and Angela Merkel is trying not to catch it because uh, Germany hadn't introduced it yet at that time. But there was a lot of pressure on her even within her Christian Democratic Union to introduce marriage equality. And she, she would go on to release the party whip in 2017. Um, this mediated tie of the activists, you know, that's really important because these norm brokers they are local. I mean, they are domestic LGBTI organizations who are also um, connected internationally through transnational advocacy networks. And their localness is important because LGBT rights are contentious and they have to be framed for distinct audiences. And they, um, you know, these actors, for example, in Poland use Catholic themes sometimes for a, a pride parade march. So this is really important for packaging them the right way to create, to generate resonance. Um, at the same time, they are also playing the game at the international level to bring in resources, draw attention, you know, bring in knowledge into their certain context. So um, if these, uh, you know, if these channels matter, then what we should see is that as they increase, as political and social channels increase, and as LGBTI movements become more embedded in transnational advocacy networks, we should see states able to reach higher levels of LGBTI uh, rights recognition. And I spent, you know, we can talk about this in the Q&A, but I spent um, over two years in the field doing interviews, archival research and participant observation with the movement. Um, but I also used that time to compile two data sets, uh, sorry, three data sets for analysis on legislation and on attitudes. And I ran a survey of the organizations uh, working in Europe themselves. And the legislation data set, which I'll show you a snippet from uh, today, is uh, spans uh, 40 years from 1970 at the beginning of gay liberation movement to uh, 2010. And it looks at 27 EU states and the dependent variable looks at categories of LGBTI rights. And again, there's different kinds of categories we can discuss in the Q and A, but you can get, you know, some states go further than others. And I look at explanations for that, looking at um, variables that capture these concepts of international channels of visibility, but also comparing them to domestic characteristics that are more commonly theorized in literature like religion, democracy, GDP, um, et cetera. And what you see here, if I just show you a little, uh, you know, a uh, little bit of, a, of one, one re uh, regression analysis, um, you see here that these international channels uh, are positive and significant in predicting higher levels of LGBT rights in the new adopter states. So again, this is looking only at states that joined the EU in 2004 and 7. If we look at the first mover states, the older EU states, you would see domestic variables playing more of a role there. But it really shows that as this norm becomes more entrenched, that international explanations start to explain why unlikely cases might introduce this as well. So I've shown you, you know, some statistical correlations. I want to briefly use my remaining time to talk about some of the mechanisms behind them. So why do these correlations exist? And there I'll take you to Poland, where in 2005, the mayor of Warsaw, Lech Kaczynski, um, he, uh, he banned an LGBT rights parade from taking place uh, for the second time, actually. He'd also done so in 2004. Yet Polish activists decided to organize it nonetheless. And they did this by 
um, by organizing it from Berlin, where, and I'm gonna read you a quote, if I can pull it up here real quick. Um, the organizers did it from Berlin and they said they, they did it there because it was uh, through new international, I'm, I quote, new international contacts with European elites. It, it was much easier for me to organize it from Germany than from Poland where the environment was very hostile at the time. In retrospect, these international political pressures were much more important than if I would have done this in Poland alone. So again, an illegal march was organized in Warsaw, but it was organized uh, from uh, another country and uh, help bring in participants and funding and resources. And you can see that here that, you know, these transnational ties bring in certain kind of resources. And so why do they matter? They bring in human resources. In 2005, a third of the participants were foreign nationals. Also many parliamentarians from other states like Claudia Rotier uh, came. Next, they bring in material resources in terms of um, funding. So this is some data from the, the organization's survey that shows that in new EU member states, the majority of funding comes actually from foreign sources. And finally, these ties bring in certain kinds of know-how and best practice. Does that mean that everything resonates that comes across borders? No, again, that's why norm brokers are local, uh, important because they're also local and can frame the, the norm the right way. So if you imagine Germans marching for Warsaw for anything, it's never, <laughs> never very resonant, uh, but um, they, they repackaged, activists repackaged that. So it wasn't Germans coming to help and march for LGBT rights. It, it switched instead to Europeans uh, marching for democratic values and human rights. So this was around the time when German, uh, when Poland joined the EU and that was still a resonant and popular theme. So that um, does that mean that Poland is a success story? Uh, no, I don't uh, go that far, but we have seen really important steps and that these due to this transnational activism. For one, they help the state in uh, making a space for these kind of uh, act activism and movements. For example, when parliamentarians came to march from other countries, they brought with them police protection. So even though the march was illegal, they were protected because of their diplomatic status and served as a human shield for these events to take place. Next, they carry with them media visibility because foreign media will then come and report on these events. And they'll report on the same event in a very different language than local media that is less used to writing about LGBT people. So that can help shift the discourse. And then finally, the presence of these parliamentarians can engage local politicians that might be from similar parties like social democratic parties. And even though it wasn't a left right issue at the time, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago in Poland, uh, left parties have started to adopt some of this platform in response to also engagement with parliamentarians that come or, or by working with them in the European Parliament. And there's many examples of, you know, the election of LGBT people for the first time or various legislation that passed or almost passed, even in a hard case like Poland that gives uh, some credibility to this idea that these transnational channels really uh, help. Uh, does that mean Poland is a success story? Not, not entirely. Anyone who reads the news today knows that this is an ongoing struggle. And this is actually what my newer work is really focusing on, both uh, resistance at the domestic level, but also at the global level, how various actors use a very similar process to what I just described to further other kinds of laws. For example, anti, so-called anti-gay propaganda laws that are championed uh, by uh, transnational advocacy networks and powerful states and international organizations that push back on LGBT rights. And so this is actually a lot of what I'm doing now by looking at L these LGBT rights in new regions and also in the European region, but on the other, you know, looking at it from the other side of the coin.